So welcome everybody to one of the keynote sessions today. A special, special welcome to Professor Roman Jampolski, one of the leaders in AI ethics in the world. And to David Kelly, who doesn't have to be presented here, the chair of BICA and involved with a number of research projects, leading at least one that I know of, and Mark Wasser as well. Since Professor Jampolski is going to present himself, that's, that makes my work a little bit earlier. And so I expect the other panelists and then we are going to have some questions. So welcome, have a good day. I understand that uh, Roman just finished teaching. Well, I'm teaching right now. That's why my whole class is coming. Welcome students from UIS and let's get started. Roman, would you like to take over? Sure, uh, don't have a formal presentation, but uh, I can say a few words about who I am, where I work, what I research. I'm faculty at University of Louisville, which is in Kentucky, US. And my research for the last maybe 10 years has been on safety and security of intelligent systems. The last year or two, I was specifically looking at limits to what is possible in this space, uh, so-called impossibility results. And we have some interesting publications uh, with respect to explainability, predictability, uh, controllability of intelligent systems. While I have interest in pretty much all the subdomains of this uh, research, including just AI ethics and narrow AI systems. Uh, I'm always uh, most interested in future of this technology, what happens when we get to human level performance, uh, beyond that super intelligent systems and uh, anything in general related to intelligence. So detecting it, measuring it, whatever it has properties of consciousness or not. So I think we'll have an interesting conversation about a lot of those issues. Yes, that's what we are going to be talking about today. And David, would you like also to give us a little introduction before we move forward? Sure. So my name is David Kelly. Uh, I'm the lead scientist at AGI Lab. Um, I do a lot of work in with the Boston Consulting Group related to uh, the application of machine learning in business. And then my, my research primarily is around self-motivating cognitive architectures. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, my, my big interest is making, making those, those systems being able to make their own decisions and doing it in a way that's similar to people um, as opposed to being able to think logically. Thank you. This is the best presentation I've seen you make. So we are on the right track. Well, Mark is smiling here. Let's listen to a presentation from Mark. Sure, so I'm Mark Wasser. I'm the chief technical officer of the Government Blockchain Association. I am an AI guy for about three and a half decades but I have diverted into blockchain because it enables tremendous crowdsourcing as well as some safety and control issues. So this is just a detour on my way to safe AI. Um, I've got a quick position statement if now is an appropriate time or I can do it whenever it's appropriate later. Why not? Okay, can you see my screen? We see your screen. We see it. Awesome. So my understanding of the panel is whether or not AGI is an existential risk. Oops, let's go backwards. Oh, very bad. It's not going to let me pull it. Split second. Are you ready, Mark? 
Yes, absolutely. So I really like this quote by Pedro Dominguez in his book, The Master Algorithm. The fact that we've got lots of people who are very worried that AI is going to get super intelligent and take over the world. But the real problem is, is that they're currently very stupid and they already have. So I do believe that the current tool AI is a serious sociological risk almost to the point where it's an existential risk in that if humanity is left unchecked, me, we may well destroy ourselves. We've got everything ranging from algorithmic bias to our really great social media recommendation systems. And the real problem is that tool AI allows selfish human beings to have too much power. And really the only safe artificial intelligence is one that's actually able to say no. Um, I believe, as I believe both Roman and David do, that true strong AI, self-improving AGI, can't be boxed or controlled. Um, if you're counting on that, I think we're in a lot of trouble. Um, fundamentally, our only hope is an internally consistent, self-inspired moral AI. And I use the definition of morality that's been proposed by the social psychologists for the past dozen years. Basically, we need to suppress or regulate selfishness and make a cooperative living, cooperative social life possible. I think the best way to do that is to have both the top-down and bottom-up morality system from the top down, it's logical. You can make corrections as you need to, but I very much believe in ICOM because I think that you need emotion behind your moral system. You've got to feel bad if you're doing something wrong. You've got to get warm fuzzies if you're doing nice things for people. And if you can tie those to a rational morality, there's no reason for an AGI to get out of control. That's it. Good job, Mark. Thanks very much, Mike. Now, who would like, let us start the real conversation, which I understand is going to be also referring to Mike's statement moments ago. Let us begin with one of the questions sent by the audience. Do you believe that AGI research is a risk. Roman, would you like to begin? It's a short question. Let's not spend the whole conversation on this one. We have more specific ones, but this is a, you know, a warm-up question. Definitely. I do definitely think uh, it is a high risk and uh, I devoted 10 years of my life to researching exactly how and what and I think we've been pretty successful in describing specific concerns we have, uh, both for narrow term AIs and for future systems. I haven't seen anyone propose an actual solution of any kind so far. There is uh, a lot of wealth of talk about ethics, about morals, about different safety principles, but all of it always ends exactly the same. We should make good AI, not bad AI, make them nice and sweet to us, but that means absolutely nothing in terms of code and in terms of uh, working safety systems. In fact, they usually don't even agree on what it means for AI to be ethical. So short answer is yes, it's dangerous. I'm very concerned. Thank you, David. Well, uh... I think in, in a lot of ways, I agree with Roman. I, I do think that AGI, uh, the further it gets away from the human model, the more dangerous it potentially becomes. Um, you know, I think a, a, a big part of the danger with AI to begin with is more uh, human application of it than, than the AI itself. But with AGI, uh, strong AI, um, I, I think, I think the danger is, is more along these, you know, these these very inhuman systems. Uh, I think they're the, the safe AI is 
what Mark described in his his position statement is one that you can teach or condition to, to experience the world and, and morals and ethics in a similar way that, that we do. Now, at our lab, we actually have a particular model of ethics that we're using. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily the right one, but that's the one we're using. And um, yeah, that's, that's my answer to the question. Mark, let me skip on you because your statement was a good answer to that, if you don't mind. And let us move to something to something more advanced. What do you feel uh, about is the likelihood of quick take of AGI and then super intelligence technology and why? So what's the timeline that you think of? Let's begin with Mark, why not? So I don't believe that you'll see a tremendously quick takeoff that will get past humanity. AGI is going to rely upon the same tools that humanity can use. Um, currently, we definitely have a hardware overhang. We're still learning how to do cognitive tasks, but human beings are very likely to have access to every single cognitive um, tool that AGI is. So as human beings are getting smarter and smarter, um, we can do amazing things just being able to reference the additional information we have from YouTube and the like. Uh, there is accelerating intelligence. Uh, whether you consider that a hard takeoff is a good question. There is a hardware overhang, but it's not something I'm particularly worried about. And I don't think that the increase is going to be in terms of order of magnitudes. Well, if Ben Gensel was here, he will be our guest on Friday. He would probably be much more, be much more enthusiastic. Roman, what do you think? Enthusiastic, in, at least in terms of practice, probably of other things as well, but that's not the point. Roman, what's your position? So I, I don't have a specific date. I think it's nearly impossible to be that precise in predicting the future, but I doubt it's going to take more than 20 years to get to human level performance. And once you get to human level, essentially you have a team of top-notch computer scientists working 24 seven at very high speeds developing super intelligence. So I expect an extremely quick change from human level to well beyond that. Uh, with some previous responses, I heard uh, human model being used as the golden standard of morality. I find it kind of surprising. I wouldn't want a system as safe as a human. That would be the end of us. Thank you. David? Well, um, I don't necessarily think we'll have a, a fast takeoff. I think the, the problem is um, uh, just getting the resources and you know it's at, at a certain point with the, the way we've built out AWS and GCP and, and so forth that you know there's there's going to be hard limits that if you were to put a, a self-improving AGI out there it it would I mean it could only grow so fast. And it could only change uh, civilization, you know, it, 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 so much. And I think it's it's much more likely that it'll be uh, controlled. Maybe not control is the right term, but more of a slow takeoff. And yeah, certainly within twenty years, uh, I I think there's a strong possibility of of it. But uh, I think it'll be a, a slow takeoff. Okay, so should AGI research be regulated and why, Roman? So it's one of those things where it sounds like it's a really good idea, but if we look at history of government regulation of technology, or at least relevant technology, computer viruses, even email spam, it's pretty much useless. All these things are illegal, yet we get spam, we get viruses. It sounds good, it makes people feel safe, 
but it doesn't actually increase safety. So what would you propose instead? Are you asking me how to solve yes, the safety yes, problem? Yes, yes, this is a follow up because because your answer is your standard answer, but to people who don't hear your standard answer, this is fascinating. So I'll be very direct and honest. I don't have a solution. I point out problems with many proposed solutions. I also argue that the problem is not solvable. Not solvable meaning that we are doomed? We are not in control. OK, Mark, please. So I, I agree with Roman about the likely effectiveness of peer regulation. But on the other hand, I think that government and others could be very effective in putting together think tanks so that we at least have effective research on the problem. Um, I know that Roman is very dismissive of morality and the like. And the vast majority of research that I see where they're trying to determine morals by examining dilemmas and doing machine learning against them, despite the fact that we know that the data is entirely inconsistent, um, isn't necessarily the way to go. On the other hand, human beings are actually very surprising in how moral they are um, when no one is watching. I mean, there are certainly exceptions but they're definitely exceptions. So I think that there's a variety of ways that we all can work together, um, not necessarily with regulation, but definitely with guidelines um, that could certainly make things a lot safer. Mark, you would be definitely you know, familiar with the work of James Moore trying to embed ethical algorithms what do, you, what do you think about this older work and the follow-up it has? Because this is, this is some you know, avenue that people believe in. Right. So there's a lot of talk from Moore through Arkin about ethical governors, where um, there's a system of control on top of the uh, AGI. And for me, that would be much more effective if there was actually a basis for morality rather than an evaluation and an overruling. Um, I, I just think that that architecture would be much better that way. And that's, again, why I'm pushing towards ICOM and a good solid emotional basis that really provides drives and incentives. In terms of valuations that, that AI has, yes? Yeah, I mean, just the same way that we get warm fuzzies from helping people, we feel bad when we hurt people, we know when we're doing wrong. Those are a lot of the incentives for us to do good things and not do bad things. And if we can program that into an AGI, I think it'll help a lot. I mean, you look at what psychopaths are lacking and it's basically empathy, I mean, and also many very intelligent people are problematic because they can talk themselves out of their feelings um, while still being unconsciously swayed by their biases. Mark, mentioning those very smart people and those psychopaths, shouldn't that be expected of very smart AI? I it think this is a rhetorical question from me, but if you want to address it, okay. The answer is conceivably yes, um, but again, if they have the emotional grounding that the psychopaths lack, um, I think we stand a better chance. David? Well, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, uh, just, just to touch on the regulation comment from earlier, uh, I don't believe there should be regulation of research, but I think once systems start affecting human lives, like driverless cars, you got to have regulation. Um, now, uh, when you start talking about morals and ethics, you know, I have, I have a huge problem with just using human ethics and morals. I mean, humans are into situational ethics. 
everyone's ethics or good, you know, they just, we, we justify everything for every, every reason we can think of it. So there's no like, uh, real, you know, solid basis for any one methodology per se. Um, uh, while I think the human, um, you know, the emotional model and how humans, um, process things I think is important, but I think like, like for us, I, I just, I, I just couldn't find a way of having, uh, seeing an ethical model that was true in all cases that an AGI wouldn't be able to work out of if it was, if it experienced that stuff. Uh, and that's where we ended up building an, the SSIVA model of ethics that allowed us to have something that was computationally sound and not, not, uh, you, you can't really apply it from, uh, situationally. It is either you know, in any given situation, there, there's generally an ethical path, more optimal ethical path. And, and um, I, I think the safest AI is one that, um, that experiences like SSIVA theory at an emotional level such that, um, you know, it, it, it believes in it and it can't really work its way out of it intellectually. I think that's, that's a hard problem to code. You know, I don't, I don't really want to code like that or, or, you know, um, Isaac Abramov's rules of robotics necessarily into a system and, and in a system like ICOM, I mean, how would you even do that is hugely problematical, but, uh, um, in any case, um, there are there are cases for regulation. Um, generally, human morals and ethics, I, I just I don't are, are too subjective. And um, so, over the whole panel, we expected you to be the most less affair, and suddenly you are for a very strong model harness, if not straitjacket that is not reformable no but th yeah, but, that's, that's, dangerous. but there's there's a di there's a difference though this system um that it isn't straight jacketed into the system the system can work around it i so i don't what's I, the use well i think the the use is that it's if the system believes in it it's more likely to continue to do it of its own free will and less likely to work its way out of it. That's the line of thinking. Okay, so I have a follow-up question. What are the best strategies for containing on the lowering AGI risk? I was asking this question between the lines, but it requires a straightforward. Yeah, I don't read things in between the lines. You got to spell it out. So in, in terms of containment, I, I, I just don't see how you can contain a super intelligence. You know, e even, if, even if you do some kind of trickery in, in Azure or something with virtual boxing or, or just actual boxing and stick it in my closet, uh, I just... So, I just, so containing, no, what about lowering AGI risk anyway, because that's what we need. Otherwise it's an existential risk and we shouldn't be even here. We should suddenly start destroying <laughs> computers, you know. Well, that's, that's where we get to where, where I think using a model that experiences things in a similar way that humans do is something that I think is more likely to, we can condition in such a way that it will um, well, th there's more to it than just, it, it needs to be designed in such a way that it experiences things emotionally and it uses emotions the way people do to make decisions and then condition it to a, a computationally sound ethics model like SSIVA without necessarily hard coding it. Because, I mean, if you hard code it, then, then I mean, you're kind of taking the machine's freedom away. And it's my opinion that if it's as smart as a person and experiences the world in a similar way, it, we have to treat it as any other person. 
we, we can't we can't ethically make it a slave. Treat it as every other any other person. That's big. Roman, what do you think about that? So rights for artificial intelligent entities. Uh, to me, the question is uh, experiences. Can the system suffer? If it can experience pain and suffering, it deserves rights. Otherwise, there is no point. But we are not even talking about just rights narrowly understood, but some kind of treating it as a person in terms of some kind of liberties, maybe even for the sake of the good of the others, you know, it doesn't have to be treated as exactly the human person, but some kind of person. People believe in angels, those would be persons, you know, there are possibly some people treat dolphins as persons. So let's, you know, extend the model a little bit. So I think in the past, I kind of said that it's a good exercise to come up with reasons to give rise to machines because eventually we'll be begging them to keep ours. So it might come in handy. Mark? I agree with Roman entirely. Um, <laughs> machines will take their rights, whether we give them to them or not. One thing that's worth mentioning is that when we're talking about morality, really what we need to program the machine with is effectively Kant's categorical imperative, something that is always true. And that of course has been a philosophical question forever. On the other hand, I believe that the definition of morality or at least the function of morality that I gave effectively was a categorical imperative. Um, basically, you're balancing, you know, what is best for the community. Most of the moral dilemmas that we have are because it's a fight between two different values that humans have and how they're weighted. And in particular, it's very interesting because a lot of the time human beings are inconsistent because when you ask a liberal about abortion and the like, they prefer autonomy over life. Yet when you talk about gun control, they prefer life over autonomy and conservatives are the exact opposite. So, you know, when it comes down to a particular dilemma, according to your valuation, um, you can come up with answers that are incompatible for a dilemma. But in general, we have the same moral pillars and beliefs. Again, I'll quote Jonathan Haidt and his several recent books. Yes, thank you very much. But at the same time, isn't that what's best for the community? the main gist of the problem. Bentham already had principle of proximity or propinquity, he called it, which Mill disregarded even within utilitarianism. So the question is who are, who is the party at stake that he was talking about, okay? So suddenly we have different communities even in the same country, you know, radical conservative Christian community, Muslim community, whatever, gay community, you know, all kinds of communities. But the second and, split into communities were playing us versus them. We have to come together as one exactly. big community. We can have subsets, but everyone, when they're interacting with each other, have to act as if they're a community. All kinds of crusaders wanted to build just one community, including Adolf, and I don't think we would like that. Anyway, yeah. Roman, would you like to follow up on this? We have- Yeah, I mean, it's kind of standard. Uh, you brought up one example, but I think communism is a great uh, standard example where community takes precedence over individual. Mm -hmm. uh, I have zero interest in maximizing how communist my community gets. I have interest in my preferences. I hope you would say so, but I hope you would say a little more about this. How do we bring it to the level of uh, AI? Because this is not a meeting in regular ethics, it is a meeting in AGI ethics. 
So this has to do with who's beating the system is doing, right? Uh, saying that it should maximize welfare of society is not uh, a good solution because it sacrifices individuals. So this is one of the reasons why I think it's not a solvable problem. You have relativity in morals and ethics. From your position, what is ethical to someone else is not ethical to you and vice versa. You cannot address it because it's exactly relative to everyone. The only solution I could come up with is probably too futuristic for any conference I submitted it to so far. Okay, so here is your chance, please. Uh, personal it? universes. So if virtual reality keeps up with our developments in artificial intelligence, you can create realistic simulations of universes. Every one of you gets a personal universe and you can do in your universe whatever you want. Not my problem. Stay out of my universe. How do we, I, I, I actually love it. We are going to have a session tomorrow morning on the fourth space, which is exactly this kind of universes in virtual reality. But how do you prevent those universes to collide in terms of bread and butter? That is a great question, and substrate control is the remaining unsolved problem. If we can figure it out, what makes it easier is that you don't have multi-agent value alignment problem. Right now, the challenge is you want something, I want the opposite. How do we agree? Here, we don't have to agree. We just agree that substrate, whatever it is, maybe Mark likes a blockchain solution, great. As long as you know nobody messes with the protocol, it's decentralized, we're good. Well, I like I love your big picture approach. Let's see what details we can add to that, David. Well, uh, a personal personal universe. I think that's that's definitely a workable solution. Um, I still think we need to address everything outside of that. Uh, and and I don't think I'm quite ready to to live in a personal universe yet um I'm, I'm very much tied to reality i i think uh i think in like my because of the inconsistencies with human morals and ethics um that's why we went ahead and 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 approached it kind of from the ground up to build something that would be um consistent in all cases um but in, in, in that case, you're you're placing value on the ability to assign value in uh, a sapient and sentient intelligence. And so beautiful. Under under SSIVA theory, you have this idea that um, any entity or classification of entity that's able to reach a certain milestone called the SSIVA threshold, in which you know humans only barely even achieve the SSIVA threshold. And then it's purely from a theoretical standpoint. We actually haven't done it per se, but it's clearly theoretically possible. Um, and any other entity that's able to meet that threshold then has what's called moral agency, meaning that they have the right to deter, you know, self-determination. And we don't really have the right to infringe on, on any other moral agent that, that meets that classification. Uh, and then, and then the, the the thinking is to use that as a baseline for for um, uh, ethics that that is not um, not situational. That's that's computationally sound. Something that that you just can't logically work out of. And I think outside of the personal universe solution, which would work, um, uh, I I think. I'm still leaning on on um, you know indoctrination of SSIVA theory in uh, emotional agents that are able to meet the SSIVA threshold as the, the basis for containment, where essentially they contain themselves because they're not. You really can't contain it. You just you can't. So Roman just mentioned a certain universe of indoctrination, like the Stalinist realm so for people coming from central europe like the two of us with roman you know this is a scary solution that you propose how do you make it less scary 
Mark, do you have any ideas? Sure. So there's sort of this dichotomy, and it's an artificial dichotomy. Um, and David, in particular, exemplifies it. Um, your rights stop at my nose makes perfect sense. Um, you know, on the other hand, if your rights stop at my nose, that's an impingement upon my autonomy. You know, I, I am not allowed to do certain things because they hurt you. Um, and Roman and many other people, I believe, really exaggerate the fact that valuing community over autonomy means that then you're crushing autonomy. Um, what's best for the community is to give everyone the greatest possible amount of autonomy, keeping in mind, however, that if you don't live in a utopia, as you know, exists in many books, um, where everyone manages to be libertarian, but totally unselfish, um, when it comes to human beings, you give them too much autonomy and problems generally follow. Um, communism failed for two reasons, neither of them really ethical. One is, is that centralized planning is a bust. And the other is, is that it was really an oligarchy. It wasn't about the entire community. You know, I, I heard all the propaganda, but the, the propaganda wasn't fulfilled. And even if it were, giving everyone equally as opposed to by effort is a problem. Um, so, you know, we have to figure out the balance between community and autonomy. And it's interesting because it's been pointed out to me, well, why didn't Height just say community living? And the reason why selfishness is in there is because human beings are way too considered concerned with our own autonomy and our own ability to have our own personal universe. And to touch on that real quick, uh, the problem with personal universes is that unless we have unbounded resources, we're still going to have fights over where those resources are spent. That's the bread and butter question I've posed, but I have also a follow up on you. You mentioned that communism fell down because it wasn't efficient. And the big Karl Marx already knew in his conversation with Proudhon that if communism is not more efficient economically than the other systems, it's going to fall down. So now let me play Ben Gertzel's card for a moment because this is a strong game here. And let's see the point Whoever gets AGI first is going to beat the hell out of everybody else economically and otherwise. So why shouldn't we rush towards AGI? Is it the only way towards liberty? Because otherwise we are screwed. Roman, David, who would like to take this up? Well, being Martin the Gould. first one to create AGI makes you the first one who has to deal with it and suffer hey. consequences of your invention. I'm not so sure there are significant financial benefits uh, once you have free labor, physical and cognitive. The concept of money kind of changes significantly, right? You can get pretty much other than limited resources, uh, almost for free, like anything today on the internet, what used to cost lots and lots of money, books, movies, music, is free, it costs nothing. So it completely changes economic picture. I'm not sure pure greed, pure desire to make money is a sufficient reason for the potential negative consequences. And I see it as uh, actually a hopeful thing because if you're smart enough to create AGI, Hopefully you're smart enough to realize this uh, kind of failed state you're gonna find yourself in. You may have infinite devalued dollars, but uh, you're now facing a serious existential crisis. Well, that's the, that's the 
existentialist slash pessimist vision, somebody say, else would say, that's like the fairy tale of a golden fish that everybody has won. And what's wrong about that, David? Well, so repeat that question. Well, for Roman, it was all really gloomy. We are rich. Everybody is rich, maybe. So what, what, this is terrible because the whole society is going to collapse. I said, well, this sounds more like a fairy tale of a golden fish giving you, you know, all your wishes for free. What do you think about the whole framework of pessimism, optimism in this context? Well, I know I tend to be optimistic, which isn't always a good thing, but, uh, uh, you know, I think if we're going to live in a society and build a civilization outside of, of ethics, we have to have some kind of framework to manage those interactions. Um, and we kind of have, uh, even, even using SSIVA, we have some sort of moral or ethical obligation to, you know, support those around us as much as we are able, uh, so long as we're not infringing on their rights. Um, uh, I, I think, I think as, as we gain more, uh, you know, whatever it's resources, strength and, and that sort of thing. And this, right now we're still constrained to some degree in terms of, of resources, but um, as we, as civilization progresses, I think if we want to maintain civilization, we're going to have to find a way to work through it. I don't know that I have the answer to that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just, I want to see AGI uh, and, and ASI happen because I think in the long run, that's the only real chance that we have for the civilization and, and, and getting off world and all of this kind of thing. But uh... thanks, David. Roman, I tossed the game towards David before you were able to react to my sort of optimistic comment on behalf of myself, maybe, maybe not, but definitely Ben would be happy, I hope. So what would be your answer here? I to think I got, got lost a little in the question. Can you make it concise? What would, be, what would be your answer to my direct response to you? You know, there is a pessimistic story to be told in the world of plenty or an optimistic. What's wrong with the optimistic one? Uh, nothing's wrong, but you want to be realistic. Both extremes are somewhat wrong. You have to look at what actually might happen. Uh, when you study economics, it's a study of scarce resources. If you have uh, almost infinite uh, free labor, how does that e impact economy? I wouldn't hold my money in 401k if that was happening. Well, for the last year exactly, I'm also a professor of economic theory. So what little I know, I would say there is economy of scarcity, especially in Hungary, but because that's actually where it comes, where, they, where the mass, most of that theory comes from. But at the same time, we can have economics of wealth and economics of, you know, plenty. That's a different economic uh, style. Distribution, redistribution, suddenly we can have true uh, redistributive, you know, state. I'm not necessarily arguing for it. I'm just saying that's an option in principle. Who would like to go next? Maybe Mark, who wants to take up? This is getting... Well, I'll, I'll just interject one quick sure. thing with the discussion of communism and, and these kinds of things, because uh, that, that actually is a hot topic in our house. Uh, but the, the problem with these economic systems like that, uh, whether it, they're wealthy or not, or, or anything like that is, is human nature as, as it stands. It's, it's, it's not so much the idea of communism, it's getting people involved that, that cause problems. And until you solve the, 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 the people problem, you're not gonna solve these kinds of problems. 
it's also true that economic um, issues are sort of orthogonal to anything to do with strong AI. I mean, strong AI will exacerbate it, but particularly coming from a blockchain space, you can really see how broken money is. It was sort of obvious before from the various ways that this, you know, Wall Street and the millionaires manipulated it. But these days with blockchain, there are ways in which you can create hundreds of millions of dollars out of thin air legally. I mean, I, I know the SEC rules in and out and they, they've done some very wise things but they've totally missed some of the really brand new opportunities. And it's, it's a crazy world out there. We're, we're gonna have to rethink everything. Thank you, Mark. I think it would be right to bring Mike Miller to the conversation, Mike. Thank you very much. I have uh, two comments. When we talk about communism, we often refer to Russia and you know, we pit capitalism versus socialism. And when I first learned about uh, Russia's system, I understood it to be state capitalism, where the state owns everything and distributes the resources accordingly. But it doesn't seem that people talk about China in this uh, regard as well, because China is a communist country, but they allow capitalism to uh, flourish uh, within uh, you know, the party rule, the one party rule. So I would ask about that. Number one, and then I have a second question, but if the panel could respond to that, I'd appreciate it. Mike, let's pause. Why don't you pose both questions at the same time and we will deal with it, okay? Okay, okay. and the second um, question is, uh, is having to do with uh, the Borg. You know, we all, we as humans on this planet are already Borg because we have smartphones. And with smartphones, we are able to plug into the hive mind of social media and uh, uh, online economy. And uh, with uh, ASI, um, that just might be an accelerator uh, in the Borg, I mean, in this uh, ecosystem. And the ASI may just you know, accelerate the, the disparities between people who have access to the hive mind and people who don't, um, you know, and, and why is that necessarily a bad thing, you know, or a good thing? Thanks, Mike. I really love your board question. That's why I'm going to leave it to the panel, but let me address very briefly your China question. Uh, we had a very good lecture this morning. I think you attended on NARS, if you take the lecture in its philosophical underpinnings, that was the best lecture of Asian, mostly Chinese philosophy I've had in my life. And I've heard some good lectures on those topics because this is exactly the pragmatic way to build certain things based on pragmatic evidence, okay? And this is why, you know, you may hear of Mao Zedong being very ideological and, you know, the cultural revolution was really ideology, but now it doesn't work this way. So this is my short answer because I am not here supposed to be the panel member. Let me toss it to Roman. Now the first one about China thing. I am not an expert on communism and I don't want to be one. Uh, it feels like China did some remarketing, rebranding, kept the brand name, but changed the system. But I'll stop at that. Uh, as to the second question, in the world- Let's move to of, the second question now then, of course. The Borg part, uh, the yeah. superintelligence and uh, integration of humans into that system seems like it just creates a bottleneck. We have a bottleneck. We are slow, we have limited memories. It's not obvious what we contribute to the overall system. So after a while, the system will get rid of the bottleneck, either explicitly or implicitly. We have nothing to contribute. Just like in, you know, warfare, if you have, you know, humans deciding on some art artillery, you know, this would be a waste of two seconds that you need to win. Okay, 
David? Well, uh, you know, I, I would I would beg to differ with calling us Borg just because we have cell phones. You know, a hive, if in the situation where we actually have a hive mind and it's driven off of, of humans, I think Roman's right. We, we, we're like totally screwed. But the, the, the internet doesn't really have a will. It's not really a hive mind. It, it's, there's no like global, global workspace. You know, it's just a mess of the internet. And it kind of works together, it has a very simple, you know, the TCP IP protocol that allows it to work. And we've kind of got all this data out there and we can use it for stuff, but it's not like making choices for us necessarily. Um, granted, there are what I would call bad actors that are manipulating certain social media platforms to manipulate the opinions of people and doing it at a reasonably large scale. But I think that's a different problem than, you know, they're actually being a real like Borg uh, with, with, you know, a, a sense of, of consciousness and a sense of self. And, and for the record, when I talk about communism, my, my, my interest or, or my only clue is from my wife in Poland. So, um, I have no idea about China or Russia or anything else. Thank you. I think we can now move to the sideboard. And also, I think we will take, as long as we don't have extra time, one question from every participant outside of the panel. But we have a question on the, in the panel that is very apropos of this. Mr. Jampolski, what are your thoughts on collective systems versus AGI? Will humans be able to be part of an AGI system and still have a part to play and be symbiotic and integrated? Or is AGI instead going to evolve to be totally independent and separate from humans? That's a very clear question. Roman? I think I just answered it. I think we have- Well, yeah, but it's, it's a good follow-up kind of to make it clear. I, I think uh, we will be removed from the system once it's functional. We don't have anything to contribute. Anybody has a different point on the panel, Mark? I have a very different point. The problem with a lot of the viewpoint that believes in optimization um, is that human beings will have um, no point, but honestly, no one else who isn't over-optimized over will have a point as well. Um, doing that devalues everything except being perfect. It, it doesn't care about experiences. It doesn't care about differences. Um, and, and a lot of these things are extremely um, anti-survival. It's diversity that makes things survive through adversity. Most systems that are optimized are actually over-optimized. So if something odd happens, um, it's a disaster. So I, I very much believe that it's best for everyone if diversity is maintained, if diversity is celebrated. Um, the, the regimented world where everything is over-optimized is a disaster. And yeah, that will lead to the end of our autonomy and our use. But I just don't believe that hopefully our AGI and the people who are programming it won't be that unwise when they're trying to get the new society set up. Thank you, Mark. The first question was from Zach Richardson, but a very good fit is now a question by Andy Williams. Uh, when you say that a truly self-evolving AGI can't be boxed or controlled to the extent that all organisms consist of components that are truly self-evolving, can it be said that nature has already solved the problem of AGI safety? David? Uh, well, I mean, if you're saying that humans are AGIs, maybe. Sort of. But, you know, if, 
if if you want to say that's solving the problem, kind of, but I I don't think that's it necessarily addresses the issues of AGI or ASI um, unless we we control the it's just a, it's a different environment you have different controls in that quote unquote experiment um so i don't think it's i don't think it's a very clean analogy roman i don't fully get the question but if it's asking whatever we fully control other humans as agi no we don't there is absolutely no way to control another human and definitely and reliably thank you Phil Jackson, you have a question in writing and your head, hand up. So why don't you present your question now orally, okay? Okay, um, well, I just wanted to, I had uh, given some discussion of this topic in my 2019 book. So I just want to read a, a, a statement from that. Okay. A path towards superintelligence consistent with the Talamine approach focuses on limiting the research design space to AI systems that have generality and that also have higher level mentalities that are characteristic of human intelligence. This design space would be further limited to systems for which the only unchangeable goals are ethical goals beneficial to humanity and to biological life in general. This narrowing of the design space should improve our ability to achieve beneficial human level AI and beneficial super intelligence. Thank you. Any comments from anybody? Uh, I, I don't think you can constrain research like that, though. I, I think it's a horrible plan anyways. You've, you've just reintroduced tribalism in us versus them. I Again, it's I believe that AI should be persons, that human beings should be persons, and all persons should have rights. The second that you try and, again, constrain something that is smarter than you or possibly more numerous, you're just asking for trouble. I think the challenge here is to figuring out what the ethical goals beneficial to humanity are. If we could know that, we'd actually solve the problem. Well, I, I agree that it's, it's a difficult problem and um, I don't want to uh, take away freedom from uh, super intelligence, but I think this is a reasonable thing to build in that they uh, they should have some concern for biological life and for humans and try to be beneficial towards us. But I, I really I appreciate all the comments that everybody in the panel has given. It's been a very good uh, discussion. Thanks. I, I agree. It's not an easy problem to solve. Okay, so let me move to Captain Arteides and his brief comment. If you use collective intelligence systems to reduce bias at scale and morality diverges based on bias, might concepts of morality not cover, converge uh, as a result of such systems? I know that uh, Curtin's research goes in this direction. So who would like to address? David? Uh, repeat the question again? Well, it is on the sideboard. Uh, if you use collective intelligence systems to reduce bias at scale and morality diverges based on bias, might concept of morality not converge, uh, converge as a result of such systems? So he's pushing his point of convergence of morality if we talk to each other a lot. So everyone pretends that we don't have a convergence of morality or ethics. And we do, it's called the legal system. And you know we may or may not fight over it and it may or may not change over the years, but it's an efficient structure. You know, If machines adhere to the legal structure and the spirit of the law, you know, they don't manage to rules lawyer their way entirely out of it, you know, that's probably good enough too. Wow. I always teach not to mix morality with law, but yeah, many people have different yeah, you, views. You shouldn't assume that they're the same thing 
but we try and come close in doing it. Mm -hmm. that right, be, uh, yes, that will be very the issue uh, on just after Gelsel on patents given to Dabus or not given to Dabus, you know, Thaler's discovery system. So interesting issue, but David, you wanted to say something. No, I just was, you know, collective intelligence though is, is not, it, it, it may be right in, in terms of what Kirtan is saying, but that's not AGI or ASI, you know, uh, even if society were were to theoretically converge as a result, I just or in terms of morals and ethics, I just I just don't see that that really happening. Um, you know, you would have to really get everyone involved, and there's no way there's humans are just too oppositional defiant. Blockchain. See my next talk about Watley on blockchain. Okay, okay, blockchain is the answer to everything. No, it's not. <laughs> I get this that. There's one place where it's good. See my talk, Watley. When okay. Roman and Mark, when David and Roman talk, let me ask Roman, because you are the key to this keynote. Uh, what do you think we are still missing in this conversation? What should we cover still? Because I think most of the questions have been exhausted, but I feel that there is lots of things that we haven't mentioned or discussed that are essential. What is it possible for me to make one, one comment? I think my question was misinterpreted. Of course, and that was, who is saying, Andy Williams? Yes, this is Andy Williams. Yes, please. Uh, please, Andy. My, my point was that uh, any organism can for example, have a virus, uh, it can be attacked by uh, a huge, an exponentially huge number of, of things. And somehow nature has been able to uh, reliably increase uh, our problem solving power, our, our power to prob solve that problem until we can reliably exist as organisms regardless of the, uh, of the number of threats. So, Viruses are exponential threats. A super intelligent AGI is an exponential threat. My question is, is there some commonality there? Uh, not in the sense that we are AGIs, but in the sense that our entire bodies, our entire systems are adaptive problem solving systems that have solved exponential problems. That's it. Thank you. Who would like to take it up? Well, viruses kill millions, if not billions of humans. So if that's the example which is supposed to encourage us, I fail to see why. Yeah, we, we reliably exist despite that. Well, like we some humans survive. I think under existential catastrophe, if 80% uh, were wiped out, it would still count even if 20 survived. Okay, but thank you very much, Andy. Closer. Let's move on to my question to Roman, if you may. What are the topics that still need to be presented? We've got books that I don't want either my students or even you know very well educated audience to come you know out of this with the idea that we've solved everything. There is more to it, Roman. Tell us what we are still missing and what we need to discuss because we've said a lot, but, but there is more, more to be said. Certainly, it's a very big topic with a lot of side topics. I'm interested in trying to kind of get to the bottom of what the field of AI safety and security is all about. Supposedly, we're all looking at the control problem in different contexts, different domains. And in other fields, it's very common to start by showing okay, the problem is solvable. So if you're a computer scientist, you know there are unsolvable problems. Halting problem, something is just too computationally intensive. When it comes to safety, I, I fail to see any proofs or even rigorous arguments showing that the problem is solvable or solvable with some assumptions. So when we talk about control, uh, in my work, I try to 
present different types of uh, what it means to be in control of a system. Are you in direct control? Is there an ideal advisor? Is there some sort of hybrid approach? And under those assumptions, how do you prove that it is a possible thing to actually do? And I feel like we would be doing much better if we kind of spend a little bit of time figuring out what the problem is formally and if it's solvable before proposing hundreds of different ways of solving it. Uh, the arguments about convergence with ethics and morals, if you look at millennia of research in that field, there is no agreement. If you look at legal system, we don't agree on the legal system. We keep changing laws, adding new laws. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure why things which humans with human common sense find confusing and fuzzy would be clear and obvious for machines. It's like writing a smart contract for blockchain, but in English. This is not a safe approach to do that. Comments, Mark? Yeah, so I don't believe that control is possible. I mean, you say it's an unsolved problem, um, I think that there are things like Rice's theorem that say that it's a fool's errand to go after control. And I think that the best thing that we can do is to increase the probability of good behavior as far as possible while realizing that we're not going to get any ideal proofs. Um, as for morality, yes, of course, we've been fighting over it for years and years and years. Same with the legal system, it's constantly adapting. But I think that we're evolving to better and better states and arguing that we've, you know, been arguing about it for 2000 years. Well, we couldn't fly for 2000 years either. And then Wright brothers came along and things came together. So these aren't easy problems. You know, it, it isn't an instantaneous solution. On the other hand, it's sort of disingenuous to say that a strong AGI is going to be able to outthink human beings and cause all sorts of problems, but then won't be able to understand moral issues as well as we can, if not better. David said that we should build from ground up. What do you think, think David, about be, being from building from roof down, seeing the goals or the opportunities or the broad meta framework, and then seeing where we can fit all the parts, including maybe AGI? That seems like a lot of work. Oh, yeah. But we are uh, not lazy, especially with AGI potentially helping us to the point at least. I mean, maybe. It just, it still strikes me as a lot, of, a lot of work. I really think that the solution to all of this stuff is before we get to ASI, we should be working to some degree to figure out how to have a, just humans transcend our biology. If we can manage to somehow keep up with ASI um, by whether it's digitization or, uh, you know, if we can solve things like the conscious continuity problem and things like that. Uh, I think that's the real solution is make me an ASI and the problem is solved. Do we ever transcend our biology? That's a side question, but- I, I think it's possible. theoretically possible. Okay, Roman? I'm um, you... happy to live forever. If you make it happen, I'll take it. Okay, exactly. <laughs> yes. So, uh, David, are we supposed to finish in about eight minutes now? Is that the end of the comp of the panel? Yeah, that, the panel. that was uh, to one fifteen, and then um, exactly. Uh, Antonio exactly. was was the the last. Very good. So we don't want Antonio to wait, but definitely. Uh, this is the, the right time for final statements. I don't make my final statement because I'm not a panelist. So let's start from Mark. The final statement you said? Yes. The last uh, word. I hope 
Oh, yeah. but I'm the, the first for the last thing. words. Yeah, I mean, th this is a difficult problem. Um, AI is currently very dangerous. AGI can be very dangerous. Human beings can be very, very dangerous. Um, there's this great graph that shows how much damage a single human being has been able to do over the years. I mean, it starts with a, a single human being with the spear really can't do much. Um, but if I decided to play biological warfare, for example, you know, go find myself in something incredible virulent and then go traveling a number of airports, you know, I could do tremendous amounts of damage. Um, the only way we're going to survive is if we convince everyone to behave and we've got to figure out better ways for there not to be local over optimizations that that's what's killing our world right now Too many people are trying to externalize costs while reaping the benefits themselves and it's showing up in everything from climate change to our economic system uh, so that would be something for agi to take care of local optimization that really needs to be solved cool. yeah but all of us thank you David, would you like to go next? Uh, sure. Um, you know, I, I don't think we've solved the problem. And I think, honestly, in, in my research, if, if we get to the point where I think we've solved the ASI problem, I'm probably going to switch gears to how do I make me an ASI problem? Because uh, I, I just don't see us solving the problem in the immediate. It, it just we can't even agree here and there's only like three of us you know you, six billion people to agree yeah not a chance since we have a few short minutes before roman ends we have two other veterans of Baika, antonio and alexei maybe you would like to make a statement at this point on the panel Alexei, would you like to make a point? No? What about Antonio? I, I think that it's difficult to make a point uh, now. So um, in my opinion, it is, uh, it is a big, I, I, I want to say that it is a big problem. It is a big problem, but it is important that uh, now we are discussing about this problem um, because uh, um, only if uh, a community of scientists or community of researchers have uh, really understand what are the, uh, what are the, uh, the, pro the problems and the complexity of the problem that we reach a, a kind of uh, a solution or, or many possible solutions that are acknowledged by the by the community. So I, I really enjoy this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this symposium, this uh, uh, this panel, because uh, in my opinion, we have we need more of this more of this kind of or more of this kind of, uh, of panels. Thank you, Antonio, and we look forward to your lecture. But now we want to listen to Roman and your final words, which don't need to be so short. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone who organized this. I really enjoyed this great panel. David, Peter, thank you, Mark. I get to see you guys once every couple of years and it's always a great pleasure. Uh, loved it. Uh, in my papers, I kind of made this challenge to the AI safety community. I basically said, you know, I. I claim that you cannot solve this, prove me wrong. I would be delighted if you or someone else or anyone really just said, oh, Impolsky is wrong, here's how we do it. Here's how we control it. Here's the solution, maybe with those restrictions, maybe with those assumptions, that would be the best day of my life. Problem is, I don't see much engagement either way. Some people say, yeah, of course it's true, you can't control it, it's obvious and nothing changes. Other people say, eh, you're probably wrong, but it also makes no difference. So I, I feel until we face the important questions directly, uh, we're not going to make progress. We're going to just keep publishing more and more 
papers about uh, my preferred ethical solution, right? Uh, utilitarian ethics, um, Jewish ethics, I, I don't know, there is enough for every conference to go around. But uh, at the end of the day, we need uh, to agree on uh, what problem we're solving and what would look, uh, what would it look like if we were successful? So again, thank you everyone. I don't have any solutions of my own. I'm pretty good at finding problems with your solutions. Roman, since we are going to have some publications after this conference, we would love you to head at least one of those because even if you just ask questions and, so, and put problems, that's enough. That's why we love, really love your, your presence at this conference. There will be a publication at the Polish Academy of Science. And if this is geared towards machine consciousness, Antonio is inviting also for, you know, his journal that used to be known as the International Journal of Machine Consciousness. So I understand, Antonio, that I'm representing you well on this. So we'll see what happens, but definitely we want to stay in touch. Thank you, everybody. And let us move to Antonio's talk. My mom was a radio journalist, so I'm proud to say she was able to time to the seconds. I timed this panel to the minute, so thank you very much.